is a current clamor for restructuring of the Nigerian Federation, genuine enough to merit any sort of serious consideration. And what form of restructuring is being canvassed? Is restructuring has been bandied about at this point a convenient way of flying the 2023 kite, who stands to benefit from restructuring if it comes to pass? Why is there resistance from the establishment on the issue of restructuring? Many questions indeed, but to take the conversation further, we're right now being joined by Dili Farutimi, lawyer and principal partner Dili Farutimi & Co. Dili Farutimi is also an author, and one of his publications is a very popular text, Do Not Die in Their War, which is a commentary on the present state of things between the leaders and the led in Nigeria. Dili Farutimi, good morning, and thank you for joining us again on The Morning Show. Good morning. Well, good morning, sis. How are you too? Yeah, well, I wish I could top all the greetings I've had thrown your way this morning <laughs> whilst waiting to Coburn, but <laughs> as you can well imagine, the rank amateur that I am, I'm all nervous and everything, waiting to be devoured by the three wise uh, ones uh, of the yeah, morning show. <laughs> we know, we know. It's good to see you. We know you won't We're disappoint. Here. Thank you for honoring our invitation. It's Quickly, restructuring is not uh, a new subject, but now all of a sudden it's gained a fresh currency. Uh, but uh, there was a statement from the uh, State House, from the presidency, saying that people are asking for the restructuring of the Nigerian Federation are unpatriotic. Uh, what is uh, unpatriotic about the idea of restructuring? You see, Nigeria is the place where English language came to die. We have found ways of giving new meanings to words. Even the question Doc just asked, he said, what is the problem, um, Nigerian Federation? Is there a Nigerian Federation? It's a lie, there's no Nigerian Federation. What you have is a unitary system that pretends, because of our own complicity, that it is a federation. And when Mr. President deemed those who have asked for a restructuring to be unpatriotic, he is completely correct. The question is, what is patriotism? How do you demand patriotism from a man to whom you have denied citizenship? So when he's talking about citizenship, and when he's talking about patriotism, the question you need to be asking yourself quickly is this. Is there really a nation? Because you have to have a nation before you are patriotic. You have to be a citizen because you can be, before you can be patriotic. Patriotism is found in, the, in citizenship. So when you are not a citizen, I have an issue. And somebody is now saying that you are not patriotic because you are demanding, because the, all the clamor for citizenship, really, are just code words. There are ways where we are just pretending that we're having a conversation around restructuring. It's really a demand for citizenship. The Nigerian is just asking to be treated like a citizen. He wants to be treated the way every other citizen of every other country in the world is treated. When the Yoruba man is talking restructuring, what he's saying really is, don't treat me as being less than the full animal. When the Igbo man is talking restructuring, he's also asking, don't treat me less as the full animal. So the full animal has been raised as the bogey, the one who has the upper level of citizenship, whilst everybody is at the bottom. I don't subscribe to that. But it suggests to you that there is inequality. But the inequality is actually one that is based on inequality of citizenship. So restructuring is actually a demand ab initio for the recognition of the citizenship. It's actually a recognition of humanity. So when Mr. President is saying that we are unpatriotic for making these demands, he should, he's very correct. We are very unpatriotic because we are not citizens. We are demanding to be liberated. So when we use the word, when we use words like um, restructuring, restructuring for every disadvantaged person is a demand for equalization. So he can say whatever he cares. It's a class issue. Those who have taken away our citizenship are neither Fulani, Awusa, Igbo, Yoruba. They are a class. All these things we talk about, tribes, religion, it doesn't matter to that class. So the president is correct, and there will be several others in other 
pro, uh, political zones of the country who will make similar declarations of the unpatriotic nature of those who are asking for restructuring. It is not the duty of the oppressor to free the oppressed. It is the duty of the oppressed to demand this liberation. So yes, we are unpatriotic, and we are unpatriotically asking to be made citizens of Nigeria and be treated as equal to every other person. So yes, we are very unpatriotic. He is the patriot. <laughs> So if the idea is really about creating a level playing field, what do you think about ideas that have been mooted? For example, Pastor Deboye talking about that president, prime minister model, state governor, premier, like we had in the First Republic, which many see as our halcyon days. Do you think we should return to that model? And if you do, should we amend it in any way to avoid their pitfalls? See, uh, um, the heresy see is for anyone to imagine that they have a monopoly of wisdom or they are the only ones who know the right way to go, to proceed and move forward. The first thing is that if people are bringing all these suggestions as Pastor Adeboye has done, it suggests that there is a realization that there is something fundamentally wrong with where we are. Now, Pastor Adeboye has talked. There are almost 200 million Nigerians. We don't even know how many we are. Now, each person is not going to speak, but there are mechanisms by which we can aggregate the ideas of Nigerians as to how to proceed. The heresy is for anyone to suggest that we are in El Dorado and it is somehow unpatriotic not to raise alternatives. Now, Pastor Adeboye has suggested something. In the book I have written, I annexed the 59-page draft constitution. I know that the patriots, comprising of people of very high intellects in this country, they've also met and they have raised a document that they call a draft constitution as well. Nigeria is not in this mess because we are lacking in ideas. And I, I dare say that there are very brilliant men and women in Nigeria who are capable of thinking us through and out of the current mess in which we are emerged. The problem is one of political will and the readiness to embrace the changes that our brains should tell us are necessary and prerequisite for us to move into a future. So any ideas should be welcomed, but there must be a way to aggregate these ideas and then allow Nigerians to have a say and decide exactly how they want to proceed. The one thing about which we are, you have almost universal unanimity in Nigeria today is that where we are, as I have said before, is not normal. This is not sane. So that Pastor Adeboye has talked is very interesting. Finally, those who have been busy asking us to pray for Nigeria are now coming out with concrete ideas. He suggests that they too are beginning to realize that praying is not working. Because if prayers were working, Nigeria should be better than Dubai by now. We have churches and mosques on each and every one of our streets. So yeah, good idea, and it's only a start. Other people have good ideas too. The idea is to create a forum to synthesize those ideas and then allow Nigerians to freely express their will as to how they want to be governed. Nobody voted for this 36 state structure. And this, are no, this is no longer a federation. The only reason Nigeria was formed in 1960 is because enough people felt comfortable within the agreed structure for our governance. And that agreed structure was clear and it was unambiguous. Federating units. To now have a fraudulent situation where a man sits down in Abuja, and if you look at the plethora of men who have sat down to create the nonsense we call Nigeria today, that continues to advertise a lie, Federal Republic of Nigeria. I'm Chinese, if we are a federation. So please, any good idea should be welcome. Pastor Adeboye's idea, excellent. There are others too. Other people should bring their ideas forward. Okay, but we've sat down many times in this country. We've been sitting down since even the time of the military, you know, to talk about the mm. way forward. How should we go about this? Sometimes they've said it's state creation. We need more state creation we need. We've even gone ahead to create up to 36 states. Because when you say, oh, I don't know, how people voted for this, you forget that we had a conference in 94, 95, that threw up uh, addition of cre uh, creation of new states, extra six states from the 30 we had before. 
So people have been sitting down in all this forum, but why haven't we gotten it right all the time? See, when a light travels for 20 years, the, the, the popular perception is that the truth will catch up with it one day. That's a lie. The truth never moves from where it sits, unmovable. It is the lie that is peripatetic. It travels, and then it comes back to exactly where the truth had always waited. We might have had all sort of contrived conferences. 1994, you said. Who, who called it? Who represented who? Who voted for those people who sat down in those, in those meetings? When you try to suppress a truth, and you begin to erect scaffolds of lies in order to preserve the lie that you have sought to promote, eventually it will come crashing down around your hair. Nigeria has had several talk shops. Each one of those talk shops sought to circumvent the will of the people. It's, there, was a, there is a situation in Nigeria where today, if you seek to bring your rural leaders together, somebody will go to Bodilon and bring Ogati Nobu. Somebody will send a message to OPC, Ghani Adams, and then they'll call all kinds of people and they'll sit them down and they'll say these are the aggregation of the, night, of the Yoruba people and these people have talked for the Yorubas. Who elected them to speak for the Yorubas? What was the agenda they, what was the agenda they presented to the Yorubas? From where do they derive their legitimacy to speak for me or, from, or for any other person? The other day, I woke up on October 1st, I was supposed to have become an Odudua Republic person because somebody sat down somewhere, probably over drunk on Burukutu or something, and he decided that he was declaring Odua Republic. Every joker somewhere is sitting down because the Nigerian state has provided room for those who will seek to aggregate the right of the citizens that they are denying. There are mechanisms for allowing the people to elect their due representatives to sit down in a properly constituted assembly of the Nigerian people. You cannot aggregate people's rights and expect that you will find expression for their grievances. All you will find is that you are providing avenues for those who trade in grievances. Yesterday, Somebody has become the uh, what is that thing? Are on Nokakanfo on account of the platform of the OPC. Another person is raising a secessionist flag in Yoruba land. And that secessionist flag is finding adherents because there are genuine grievances that are not allowed to find expression. The same thing you find in Yoruba land is what you find in Igbo land. That is why you have an Inam Dikano speaking the language of the extreme, because those who speak moderate languages are not listened to by the Nigerian state. The grievances are genuine. The grievances go back 54 years. But if we continue to pretend as though we can bury these grievances under palliatives, you are creating states. There were three regions, federating regions at our independence. There was a mechanism that allowed for the creation of an additional region. That was reflected in the 1963 constitution. When the military came in 1966 and Gowon created states at the outbreak of the civil war, he destroyed the federation that he inherited. We have for too long perpetrated the myth of Agui in Rosi being the one that unitarized Nigeria. It is not. The reason I'm going back into history is for you to understand that what they are seeking to bury, which is why they are creating talk shops that are unreflective of the will of the Nigerian people, what they are seeking to bury is the federal system itself. When you now break it down into unviable states, where you now have 36 states in all, each one of them unviable and unable to function as a state, you have the incongruity of a federal government that is creating federating units. And then you want us to sit down on the basis of that fraudulent situation and then begin to have a dialogue that would result in peace, which is what everybody is seeking. It won't work. We have to honestly admit that where we are is not working. And where we want to go to can only work when you truly reflect the will of the Nigerian people. The first condition of humanity is justice. When people feel perpetually aggrieved by a governance system, that nation or state 
will continually be in a state of war. It might not necessarily be pitched warfare, where parties are standing across from each other and taking pot shots. But all you need to do is look around Nigeria. Each and every one of our grievances are playing out in real time for the wise to see. And we are still talking about the unpatriotic people asking for restructuring. Restructuring is, is actually the only way that you can save Nigeria from what appears to be certain disintegration, a cataclysmic one for that matter. So if people want to sit down and continue lying to themselves about those of us demanding restructuring as being the unpatriotic ones, hmm? it's up to them to tell themselves their lies. Well, Dele, um, restructuring means so many things to different people. True. And you have referred to that. You have yourself talked about justice, about equality, you've talked about level playing field and all of that. But now that uh, 60 years after independence, we're preparing for the next 60 years and looking into the future. What are those specific things, central key things that you think can transform Nigeria? The first thing that was lost before we got into the mess we are in today was the rule of law. If the law should rule in Nigeria, we will not be all this restructuring talk. They actually buy words for several other things that we have subsumed beneath restructuring. Restructuring is more of a binary vision result. When the people have looked at where they are, everything appears mad, and then you want to run away from declaring a support for secessionist argument. You start saying, okay, we don't need to break, let's restructure. So there is a third angle that we conveniently ignore in the demand for restructuring. And that angle is that the real demand is actually for equalization. Equalization can only happen where the law rules. If the law does not rule, if impunity reigns, even if you restructure Nigeria and you don't have the law as the anchor upon which everything revolves, you're just wasting time. So, Yes, restructuring means different things to different people, but the one that is paramount, that must be there, whether or whatever name you call it, even if you leave Nigeria the way it is right now, bad, as badly structured as it is, if the Nigerian state dares to allow the law to rule, I, dare, I would say that the agitations would even go down significantly. People are shouting, NSAS, NSAS. The only way you can ever end SARS is if, if the policeman carrying the gun knows that there will be consequences for the shot that he fires. When he recognizes that the person he is shooting is a citizen in relation to whom he must offer an account, not only to the state, but to the family of the persons that he kills. The only reason the Nigerian police kills with impunity is because he knows that there will be no consequences. The state is structured to protect the rulers. As long as he doesn't kill a member of the ruling class or one of their children or sympathizers or somebody, a worthy, even when worthies are killed, sometimes nothing happens. So the centrality of citizenship, the rule of law, these are central issues. They are core issues that are subsumed beneath the demand for a restructuring of Nigeria. It is the binary vision that sometimes allows those things to get eating underneath and get lost in the noise of the arguments that we raise. Equalize citizenship, let the law rules, restructuring becomes a byproduct. So who is to address these fundamental issues that you've just stated? I read a comment by Alaji Tanko Yakasai saying that people should not direct their ire at President Buhari, that it has to be directed at the National Assembly and it's up to them to legislate. Where do you place the ball? In whose court? You see, um, I have no faith in the capacity of either President Buhari or the, nation, the National Assembly particularly. I even think that it is a little simplistic and particularly idiotic for anyone who is truly desires of changing Nigeria to look to the existing structure to, in any way, shape, or form, contribute to the way forward. My own position is that 
if I am benefiting from a system, and the way the rulers in Nigeria benefit from the system must be clear, let's, let's be clear, it's not just that they are corrupt, it's not about corruption, it's about the fact that they are divorced from the citizens. And I use the word citizen loosely because in reality we are not citizens. So when you have a situation where the rulers are divorced from the root, and you are now asking those who are benefiting from the status quo to lead the reformation, you're asking them to commit class suicide. I actually believe that it is up to those of us who are disadvantaged, oppressed, to organize ourselves. Demands cannot be made of power, as somebody has said, at a coffee table. Some people went on the street on the 1st of October. Mr. Adesino, who once upon a time said people were irritants, I believe he called them. I hope he was well irritated enough. And that is just the beginning. By the time this system elects to refuse the reformations that are clearly needed, there are further mobilizations of the Nigerian people that are ongoing. And the demand will be placed in the public domain. And we will be calling for matches on the streets of Lagos and every other Nigerian city. We will not be violent. We gain nothing by being violent. It is the state that is perennially violent. And we will continue to ask our people not to be violent. But to expect that the National Assembly, in Doma Egba, or what, uh, no, not in Doma Egba now, the, what, the mace snatcher was the one that was issuing some circular a few weeks ago calling for memorandum to be submitted. How do you expect to persuade ravenous wolves to become vegetarians and then help you just give you some, so please, we know that you are the ones who are enjoying the nation. So we want you to help us to restructure it, just losing our rope a little. How? It's not going to happen. They will never give us what we want. It's not in their interest. But it is, our, it is in our own interest to clearly identify what we want, sell that to the Nigerian people, and then mobilize the Nigerian people behind what we have presented to them. Several people have presented different things. It is time for the Nigerian people themselves to sit down, aggregate. And we are currently talking to ourselves. There has to be an aggregation and there has to be an adoption. If we have a central platform from where we can engage the Nigerian people, it becomes easier to make these demands. But to ask that we wait for the beneficiaries to be the ones to initiate the changes is a waste of time. Nothing good will come out of it. Okay. Uh, if you heard the president's speech, I'm sure you did. I didn't bother. It's on a the, waste of time. Okay, on the first of so I'm going to it's quote. A waste of time. I'm going to quote from the speech. The president Please. talked about the fault lines in this country, and uh, talked about it in such a way that uh, what really ties us together are more than these fault lines. You know, these fault lines might be fault lines whipped up by a lot of other people because of their grievances of some sort. I mean, what's your take on all these fault lines? And do you believe that these fault lines? Let me, let me say this to you. Yeah. I was talking to a friend driving here this morning. He sells cars. And he was sharing his experience with me. If you're going to the northern part of Nigeria from Lagos, between Lagos and Lokoja, there are 40 custom checkpoints. 40. After Lokoja, all the way to Katsina, not one. Between Lagos, hear me again, between Lagos and Lokoja, 40 custom checkpoints. That is within the border of Nigeria. But once you have crossed Lokoja, not one until you will get to Katsina. And we are all in Nigeria. Let's be clear about something. I have never expected that the beneficiary of a crime would, in some way, turn around undetected and be the one to offer restitution. When, when you look at the hard facts, and that is a hard fact, it's verifiable. 
And I'm sure that there are several people who will be able to say whether I am a liar by the time I am out of your studio this morning. 40 checkpoints, Lagos to Lokoja. Lokoja to Katsina, none. Now tell me, who gains from the destruction of our internal commerce? So it is difficult, very difficult, to begin to wrap one's brains around the inanities that are offered when we begin to point at real issues. That's just one, but it should illustrate a lot for anyone who is willing to look objectively. Nigeria and Nigerians are the problem of Nigeria. The average Nigerian has no problem with his neighbor. But our system is structured in a way any system that allows what I just described to you cannot be said to be just. In a situation where you enter a government institution and you see the manifest and clear marginalization of vast parts of the same country, what you are seeing is the legitimization of internal colonial colonialism or an apartheid system that we are being asked to legitimize by our silence is either you are benefiting from it and you then don't want to talk about it, why would you want to change what is working for you? But if you are, if you are an Igbo man or a Yoruba man or anybody for that matter who has reason to transport your goods from Lagos up north and you have to contend with the fact that between Lagos and Lokoja, you are going to find 40 checkpoints that you will not find one after Lokoja, then tell me, how do you explain to such a person that he has no need to be demanding a restructuring? He will demand that restructuring because he knows that if Nigeria is restructured, he will not see those custom checkpoints on the road. Meanwhile, he is a businessman. The only reason he's talking restructuring is because he wants equalization. So beneath restructuring, you find a whole lot of things that are hidden. A lot of grievances are hidden underneath the demand for restructuring. So when we refer to the, and it's a truism, Nigerians don't have problems with themselves. Allowed a level playing field. The average Nigerian is happy to be here. Next 60 years, forget by the next 600 years, we want to be here. I could have left Nigeria, but I haven't left, I'm here. Because I believe in Nigeria, and so do a lot of other people, Ausa, Ibo, Yoruba, nobody really cares for these tags. If you are demanding that racism should end, Black Lives Matter, how do you really find the moral standpoint to speak about Black Lives Mattering if your life does not matter to you, Ibo life does not matter to you, Fulani life does not matter to you? Agusa life does not matter to you. The people being slaughtered in southern Katsina, they are human beings. The people being killed in Katsina, they are human beings. People losing their lives every day in different parts of Nigeria where the state has failed woefully, they are human beings. They are Nigerians. They are suffering. So when we talk about the fact that Nigerians have, um, we are united, yes, we are united. It is the system and our rulers that are dividing us. They profit from those divisions. They profit by it. And when you are demanding restructuring, remember, the demand for restructuring is just a cover for several grievances. People are in pain. Interactions with the Nigerian state occasions pain. Fela sang about it. He called it country of pain. Why must our country be a country of pain? Why must all our interactions with the Nigerian state instinctively inflict pain on us? How do you rationalize a situation? Hear that madness. 40 checkpoints to Lokoja, none after Lokoja. If you, are in, if you are in the business of moving goods up and down Nigeria, that is the reality you live with on a daily basis. I heard it this morning, and I was shocked to the marrow. But the person whose reality exists with that madness on a daily basis, how do you demand patriotism from him? How do you look him in the eye and tell him that he's unpatriotic for, for saying that Nigeria should be restructured? 
What do you want him to do? Carry a gun and start demanding a secession? So Nigeria is the problem of Nigerians and our rulers. And it doesn't matter whether the ruler is Yoruba, Ibo, Fulani, or whatever. It's a class. It's a single class. All these divisions merely masquerade and cover their activities. At that level, no divisions. All of a sudden, anti-corruption, sir, the daughter is busy marrying Atiku's son. Uncle Tinubu was there. But that, Baba Kondi was there. There are no divisions. We are the ones who keep lying to ourselves. We divide ourselves. So when we talk about restructuring, understand it. It's the mask we wear when we don't want to appear to be secessionists. We just want equality. Earlier on, you uh, made reference to Odudua Republic. Yeah. And uh, it looks like you are one of those Yoruba leaders who do not support the idea of uh, Odudua Republic. <laughs> knowing, of course, <laughs> knowing, of course, that self-determination uh, is an internationally uh, recognized uh, right. Are you against the very idea of succession? See. And what is your objection to Odudua Republic? See, I... I once subscribed to the heresy of secession. I was even one of the ideologues in my younger days. I, I believed that was the solution to Nigerian problems. But I have evolved. Human beings should be able to embrace knowledge, and then if you have superior logic, drop what you used to believe was right, because you have been presented with better evidence. When I sat down to reflect deeply on the subject of secession in Nigeria, what I found very quickly is that secession is actually a position informed by assumed weakness. And you've asked the question that requires a bit of, I need to do a bit of unpacking, so please, please give me some time. There, at the back of Nigeria, and I'm not talking 1960, going as far back as 1947. And I have historical evidence of this, an account written by Sasha Smith. He was the last governor general, he was the last governor of northern Nigeria. He wrote a book, he titled it, But Always as Friends. Now, Shaw Smith recounted, the, he gave an account of what led to the 1951 House of Representatives. He spoke of how the northern part of Nigeria, and I use the word northern part, I use it as an, I'm using it as a borrowed term because I don't believe in that myth. They were assured as far back as 1947, he's written, and I'm using materials from that book in my upcoming book. What they, man, what they did was they assured them that, look, don't worry, in the Nigerian Federation that will be created, you will get half of the seat in the parliament. Now, at that point, the preoccupation of the Yorubas and the Igbo, because there were always these three contending forces, the Fulani, the Yoruba, the Igbo, they believed that as long as there was a federal system, they would be able to survive anything that might be done in relation to the structure, as long as they could govern their own side. So, the focus of the Southern people in the immediate aftermath of the inequalities that began to emerge after the 1951 inauguration of that parliament was always, okay, what's come to us will stand in our region. So the regions became stronger and stronger and became more and more of tribal enclaves. And then you had the minorities raising their fears about the domination of the big three. Now, when I say big three, remember, there was a mythical tribe that was created in the cauldron of Nigeria's bat. And that mythical tribe is called the Ausa Fulani. There is no tribe known as the Ausa Fulani. But in order to hide a particular agenda, that tribe had to be created as a myth. It was a cover. Now, by the time the Nigerian Federation became to come apart at the same, by the time it began to come apart at the same in the aftermath of the coup, what happened was that the Igbos 
in seeking the protection of their rights. I've, 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 what I've done is I've summarized a lot, but I know as a fact that I'm speaking with a lot of intelligent people. I'm not flattering you. I know Dr. Abati, who has the question, is informed. Now, in the cauldron of that 1966 coup, what happened was that the Igbos reacting, and I say reacting deliberately, there's a difference between reactions and responses. The Igbos reacting declared, after the failure of Eburi, decided to go alone. The Yorubas, ambivalent. But there was a third force that everybody has always ignored in Nigeria, and that third force is the one that did not seek to leave, but sought to dominate and control what was given to them after the July 1966 coup. Now, that force enjoys it when the Igbos begin to demand Biafra, when the Yorubas begin to demand Odua Republic, because it takes attention away from what everybody could agree on. What everybody can agree on, and I say this without equivocation, over 90% of Nigerians across the length and breadth of Nigeria would agree to a restructuring. But when you begin to speak in terms of secession, what happens immediately is that you play into the hand of those whose intention is to dominate the rest. Because the minute you begin to speak secession, you raise the alarm of the minorities who know that if Nigeria is broken along the lines that all the secessionists have been demanding, their interests are further jeopardized. Because if in 1950s they were demanding that the Willings Commission should create guarantees for the interest of the minority, is it now when even within Yoruba land you have marginalization and an Ibadan man cannot, and a man that is not Ibadan is struggling to be governor in your state, and Okeogu man does not have equality in your state. Is it now that in Lagos State you are having struggles between the company? In Lagos State, you are having people telling other people where they're coming from. You are having people being told that they are not indigenous enough. You are having even within Lagos State. <laughs> so you have a situation where Awolowo was the one that first said this. He said, if you continue to clamor for the creation of state until Ikene becomes a state, the agitation will not end. The creation of state was always meant to dilute the centrality of Nigeria's focus on federalism. If you keep breaking it down. The more you, who is breaking it down in the first place? Where else in the world have you seen the federal government creating federating units? Dr. Abati, you are a lawyer. I know you studied Nigeria's, you've studied constitutional history. Where else in the world, in the entire wide world, where they, say, where they claim they have a federal system, does the federal government create states? So secession is a distraction. A distraction because it takes attention away from what is winnable. What is winnable is an easy win. Easy win when you begin to demand that Nigeria be. Re what is the argument against restructuring? What is the argument? There is no argument against restructuring. That is why President Buhari, General Buhari, will be talking about unpatriotism. What is unpatriotism? Who is more unpatriotic than the person who, who will take money to build a rail line to Maradi when you have children, over 14 million of them walking on the street? And then he's building a rail line, 1.9 billion or something like that to Maradi. They are spending 36 billion or, or they are about to renovate the National Assembly. Who is more unpatriotic? Patriotism should not be equalized with slavish support for stupid leaders whose only interest is to enslave the people. They are enslaving us. So to now be demanding, how can you ask me to be patriotic when you are busy decimating the future of my children whilst I'm still alive? So let's be clear. Nigerians asking for secession have genuine grievances that has battered their demands. But I cannot support it because I know that it is a distraction and it merely aids our oppressors and enslavers in obfuscating the real issues. The real issues are clear. It's about equality. No Nigerian, unless you are mad, you can't stand in front of me and tell me that I don't have a right to demand equality before the law. You cannot tell me that I don't have a right to demand to be treated the same as every other Nigerian wherever they might come from in Nigeria. That is not an unreasonable demand to make. When we now leave those demands and somebody 
some, in fact, I even feel insulted sometimes. The people who are declaring the republic that I'm supposed to be a citizen of, some of them can't even articulate the grievances that has pushed them into declaring. Okay, it's not their fault. Somebody was busy declaring something similar yesterday. Today is a is, is a millionaire many times over. Nigeria rewards madness, and that is why madness has become endemic. It rewards madness. If it does, if it, think about it, think about it. We are sat down here, and there are real life issues plaguing Nigeria. Real life issues that should interest anybody that still retains a modicum of consciousness. People travel outside Nigeria. They're coming into the airport, and the minute they come through, they remove their brain. They check it into their luggage. <laughs> because they know that the retention of their brain will only lead to their untimely death, exploitation, in the hand either of the state or one of his agents. And then you tell me that the answer to that is secession. By the time you are done breaking up your rubber land, okay. The Awusa, the Fulani ruler of Lagos State in the last 21 years, are we deporting him? The ones who have been busy ruling in Abia State, are they going to be deported to Zamfara or Katsina? This, argu this secessionist argument, anyone with half a brain should stop it. Is, no, is actually unedifying. Because what we are I am a firm believer in Pan-Africanism. I am of the opinion that the only way the black man is ever going to come out of the perpetual servitude into which he has been locked will be for us to find common cause as a race. When I now hear someone, he lives in Lagos, and he's looking at all the solutions he believes would solve our problem in Nigeria. And he says, oh, we must break up. OK. Which foreign power am I paying tolls to in Lagos? There is no house in Lagos today that hasn't paid. If you've built, if you've built a house in Lagos in the last 10 years, you paid at least Cumulatively, you couldn't have paid less than 5 million naira to Lagos State in one form of fee or the other. Cumulatively, between uh, governor's consent, approval, one thing, one thing, or the other. How does that show on the street of Lagos? How does decline? No, in fact, the other day, one Lagos indigenous was telling me, Gedegbe Lekoa. And I was laughing to myself, Gedegbe Lekoa. The solution to Lagos' problem is secession of Lagos within the scope of the breakup that they are all envisaging. When you are done now breaking that Lagos into the, the okay, it will now be the Republic of Bodilon. <laughs> what happens at that point? <laughs> we should stop all these distractions. Mr. Sarah, yes, madam. We have about a minute left, and you have made it very clear: secession is a distraction. It is. Very quickly, what are the consequences of a failure to restructure, of a failure to focus and get it done? Because as Nietzsche said, they muddy the waters to make it seem deep. This is not an intractable problem. What is the failure? What is the consequence of the failure to get this done? It scares me to think about it. But the reality is that Nigeria has one shot at it. And that shot is probably less than 12 to 18 months window. If we fail to restructure and we continue this dance of death and enter 2023, or we keep progressing towards 2023 with the different forces that will be contending for power, the grievances that are already multiplied, I see a horrible implosion. If we, who are seeking change, or shall I say a revolution, if we are unprepared and we have failed to convince the people of that need, what is likely to happen is that there will be an implosion. And that implosion is not the first time such implosions will be happening in Nigeria. But this time around, Nigeria does not have the structural integrity to withstand that implosion. There are actors in the game who have decided that they are ready for all kind of shenanigans. Look at the north. Just look to the north. Look at all the trouble spots you'll find very quickly that it conforms with old fault lines. 
president is talking of fault lines. There is ethnic cleansing going on in the north. It is because some people are preparing for some things. There are different forces arming themselves. We are not blind. Any fool can see what's going on in Nigeria. If we don't find the goodwill to restructure and do so quickly and honestly, I am not too sure that the Nigerian state can withstand the shock of the contentions that are coming ahead of us. Uh, on that note, I uh, would like to thank you very much, uh, Dele Farotini, for joining for us yes, on thank the you. morning show. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.